Welcome to the Accomplish More podcast created specifically for the small business owner who doesn't think small. I'm your host, Gayla Scrivener. This show is where you'll learn practical ideas, hints, tips, and tricks to help you grow your small business where you can leverage your time and to accomplish more. Thanks for joining me today for another episode of the Accomplish More podcast. You know, one very important thing that we must all learn to do more effectively so we can accomplish more is to delegate. Building teams is an essential part of growing any business. Teams can come in many forms and they certainly don't stay the same. As your company grows and evolves, so does your team. I've talked in the past episodes about my experience in growing my team as I grow my business. I realize that I go through some of the same struggles and growing pains as many of my clients. You know, it's hard to delegate. And there are many reasons that we delay getting help. Understanding ourselves and hearing other people's experiences helps us work through some of those obstacles that are holding us back. Today, I'm excited to share with you my recent interview with Jennifer Phila. Jen is the founder of Aspire Research Group and Prospect Research Institute. Her market is targeted to the prospect research industry, primarily with larger nonprofit organizations. We've been working together for several years, and I thought it would be an excellent opportunity for you to hear her perspective in growing her businesses and starting to grow her virtual team. She gives some fabulous insight and is candid on what she has experienced on her journey of growing her small business. I think you'll enjoy the discussion, so let's get right to it. Well, welcome, Jen. I appreciate you taking the time with me and talking today on the Accomplish More podcast. You know, we, we talk frequently since you know we work together and everything, but I don't think we talk quite like this because I'm going to ask you different questions today. Do you mind telling the, the listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure thing. I Thank you for having me on the podcast. It, it is fun. I, I have my own podcast and I'll tell you what, being a guest is a little nerve wracking, but I, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Too much fun. It's funny. I, I knew you were going to ask me about myself and I ask people that all the time. So what I love to hear about is the real people. So I wanted to let you know that you already know I live in Florida and I'm very yep. happy here because it's warm. And I'm also a mother and a grandmother. That shapes a lot of my life. And I'm a small business owner. And one of the beauties about the flexibility of working for myself is that I can do that. I can take a day off and watch my grandson and then work on Saturday. And my boss is perfectly fine with that. So I love being a small business owner. It requires more discipline, perhaps, than the times when I was an employee, but it's very rewarding. I really enjoy that. You jumped out of being employed to your own business owner. How long ago? That was 10 years ago. It's hard to believe. See, I almost forget about that part of my life, being employed. When I was growing up, I just thought being a secretary would be a wonderful thing to be because I, I love organizing things. And I was a legal secretary for 10 years. And then I got my degree at night and I started working in the nonprofit field as a fundraiser and a program person. I ran a program as well. And then I fell into prospect research. It was a nice fit for me. And when I met my husband and we wanted to travel for longer periods than a typical vacation benefit would provide, I decided I would launch my business for some added flexibility. That was in 2007. Well, that was certainly one of the driving forces for me to jump out of working for someone to working for myself was to have the flexibility, but you're a business of one. I mean, you start, you were doing everything at first, right? I was. I did everything wrong when I started. Um, I didn't read anything. I just kind of said, hey, you know, I was in Philadelphia at the time and it's a very mature fundraising market and everyone knows what prospect research is or so I thought. And well, everybody needs this. I'll just do it for myself because I love doing research. And I wasn't really thinking of it as a business per se, except that I knew, you know, I had to run a business uh, Mm -hmm. to be able to provide those services. So I kind of just, I scraped by for a couple of years before I got a little more serious about it. 
and I did a lot of subcontracting work in the beginning to get started. When I first met you, and I just had this fuzzy idea, prospect research, what does that mean? Why don't you tell folk about, you know, the types of clients you serve and how you help them? Sure. Yeah, not many people know what prospect research is. And I'd like to explain it that we support nonprofit fundraisers and we help them find things that they worry about. So maybe they have 100,000 records of donors. Well, who should they focus on first, especially for major gifts? So we can help segment their database of donors. We can help identify people who are most interested and most capable of giving. And then once a fundraiser knows who those people are, it can be intimidating how much exactly should they be asking for from that person. And we help do that kind of in-depth research. And from there, it's just a matter of whatever kind of research helps inform their fundraising, whether it's you know, managing the process of keeping track of all their prospects or researching specific individuals, companies, or foundations. And so it's much more effective to do your research before you just do this calling and asking for gifts for a nonprofit. Yes, there comes a time in a nonprofit's development where, uh, you know, in the beginning, it's just broad community support. You are asking for money. Um, straight up, you know, and, and you're asking for smaller gift amounts, whether it's $5, $50, $1,000. It starts to become a little bit more. Could you give $10,000 this year? So a, a nonprofit will have prospects uh, or existing donors they can ask to step up to those amounts. But then at some point, there's usually a campaign of some kind. They need to expand in a much bigger way, whether that's a building that needs to be built or programs that need to be deepened or broadened. And at that point, people start to really look at prospect research because now the pool is wide and big and I have a big number to reach. So I have to be more efficient in, and focus on asking people to give who are capable of giving to meet our goals. So that's where research typically pops into the nonprofit world. I've been working with you for a few years now, and it's just very intriguing. <laughs> and it's fantastic market, I think. Well, it does take a bit of work to get someone to part with a million dollars. They want to feel comfortable with your organization and that they understand how it'll be used, but also it needs to match their passions, their philanthropic passions. Mm -hmm. So that takes research. And so you jumped out on your own to have your own consulting business and your own research business. It was just you doing it. As you were growing your business, when did you feel like you needed to get some help or hire an assistant? Or did you hire contractors to, to help you early on? Or how did that work for you? Well, one of the, I think the problems with me is, and why I love working for myself so much is because I love to chase new ideas, and employers typically don't like that. They want you to do the work that you got hired for. But the other thing is that I like to do so many different kinds of tasks. So I love creating a newsletter or designing a marketing piece or doing a video. Um, I just I enjoy it, and so I will be meticulous about every aspect of it, and that takes a lot of time. And there was a period of time when I got serious about sales. I decided that if I was going to keep the business and not get a job, then I had to get more efficient with my own fundraising, so to speak, with my own sales, and that took up a lot of time and effort. It became a tug of war with my time. I was doing the online newsletter and spending, when I tracked my time, you know, over an hour formatting, just formatting. And then I had to write the article and I had to figure out all the other pieces that went in it. And I wasn't sure about the return on that because it's marketing. So, you know, lots of times it's tough to see a direct return on marketing stuff. And that's mm -hmm. when you had been, you and I had been talking for a bit and you were telling me about the different newsletters you were doing in your new business. And I finally said to myself, well, you know, I can't do it. I, I should just let go and let Gayla do this. So that was our first task together because sales was a pressure. Time became a pressure. Although I enjoy formatting newsletters, it was something that I could give away. 
And that the, the content piece you retain because that is very personal. You're the expert. But then, gosh, getting into something like constant contact, it the content can be there, but formatting, it sure does take, it does take an hour or so. And that hour, you could be talking to a prospect. Yes. And at the time, my sales were local. I was focusing on local sales. So that was a lot of travel time. So it really was a time crunch. And that, that was the first thing, was one newsletter once a month. That's what we started out with. How many years ago was that? <laughs> it's been, quite, it's been quite some time. That one hour of savings, and then we got a, a process going. And what I've seen on my side is there's been a lot of improvements, but I don't just do that one monthly e-newsletter. I've added on quite a few tasks for you, or you've added them on, or what however you want to put that, <laughs> but how'd that transition, what, what went on with, with your perspective on your transition for letting go more? It was a cumulative effect. So once you started doing the newsletters, and as I started to do more and different things, and I also started the second company, it, uh, and you, I, I'm pretty sure you helped me with some of that data work as well. So one of the things I did was look at, well, who is my audience? And that's how the new company started. And then there was less of a focus on the first one. But I I think once one task is let go and I can trust, we started to work out a system where, so you start to do some of the data entry for the sales piece, you know, the, the database, keeping track of everything. It was so good to let go of those pieces. And it's funny because we still do this seesaw with those tasks where sometimes I do more of them and sometimes I push more of them off on you. And that has to do with timing, stuff like that. But I think a lot of mess happened in the middle. It always feels very messy to me. So you and I will work on something and I'll, I'll start to struggle and I'll start to say to myself, well, how can I break this up? Um, you know, what should I be focusing on? And then you and I will discuss it and we'll figure out what pieces you can take. And one of the examples of that is social media. So we have gone through multiple iterations of working together on social media and they haven't all worked well. Or maybe some of them worked for a bit of time and then I changed it up. And I have hired other people to do bits and pieces, and sometimes that worked well, and sometimes it didn't work at all. So I I think the best part about adding new things with you was that level of trust. You don't let things drop. And at one point, I remember thinking to myself, oh my gosh, you you mentioned something that you were doing for me or you had on your list. And I was like, wow, I didn't even realize you were doing all that. And when I looked to add an employee, whether it was for the first company or the second company, I said, well, gee, I better figure out what Gala's doing (laughs) because maybe it's time for a full-time, you know, office manager or something like that. And in the the evaluation, that was not the best place to put a full-time employee. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think that's kind of funny. So I think it's just been gradually being aware that I can delegate even though I enjoy the tasks and, you know, the podcasts are the next thing. Like, yes, I don't mind editing, but now that I've worked out how I do the podcast and what works best, how much time is best spent on it, then I can let go of some of those pieces. You know, so yes, I have to figure it out in the beginning for myself. Like, what is it I want to do and what works best for me in the business? And then once I've got that, then it's time to delegate it. If I try to delegate it too soon, we end up coming back and starting over. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, it does. What I find with you is you're you're highly organized, which is phenomenal. But sometimes you may not feel that way because you're processing how how should it look in the future. And I think we all go through that, that even the most organized person trying to figure out exactly how the pieces will fit together, especially when you're doing a new process as you keep what works and throw out what doesn't. I think that the communication that we have, it helps me feel like I'm on target and at least assisting you the way 
that you need to, and I feel comfortable that, oh, I've got these tasks, they're routine, and they just need to happen on a schedule. And that is great. And then when the other things are thrown in there, I enjoy it because over time, it seems like when you do throw things, different things at me, we already have this foundation that I know where to go. You don't have to tell me every detail or every path. You know, you can, I guess you can talk to me in shorthand (laughs) and I kind of know what you're, what you're meaning. And like the, the other day you, you did throw in a new initial um, for me and it took me a second. What is she meaning? W A. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so, the acronyms yes 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 and certainly didn't happen overnight but it feeling comfortable with just saying I don't understand what you're meaning or you're talking cursive if <laughs> I don't understand and feeling comfortable with asking questions and when we don't see each other communication can be a challenge and that's the best bit our weekly meetings are fantastic mm-hmm. Because it is complex now. There's two businesses and you're doing mostly marketing tasks, but then, you know, lots of other little things in between. So if we didn't have that weekly meeting, and that was your suggestion, I believe, I think we'd be falling apart by now. And I think that that just, it grounds us both, actually, because I know that you've got things that you want to hold yourself accountable to, and then I want to hold myself accountable to. And then it just is a great way to air out questions. It's a process for you that you've got this idea and then you, you talk it through. And sometimes I don't, I don't know what path you're going, but you're talking and then you make a decision and then we go with it. You are very kind because yes, sometimes I just need someone to talk it through with. And since I am on my own, that's not my husband. (laughs) He doesn't play that role. (laughs) So it is really helpful to be able to talk it through with you because you do understand. And you actually point out gaps for me many times. So there's opportunities to market across the two companies. And I sort of forget that, you know, oh, if we are going to create this new piece for the one company, we should probably be putting it in these other places as well. So that's also been a, a huge benefit of working with you over the years because you're really coming up with that initiative on your own. I don't have to tell you exactly what to do. What was probably your number one fear of getting help? Money. Money Money. is usually my number one fear (laughs) for most Mm -hmm. decisions. And I've just gotten bolder. Bolder as I get older, I guess. So I, I worried, you know, am I going to spend money on a marketing task? That's not bringing me business. And I have to meet these sales goals to make a living, to turn the light switch on. And so how could I justify spending money on my newsletter? And really, that's just a distorted, illogical thinking, because the time I spend away from those tasks I'm making a lot more money than if I spent that time on those tasks. So now it's a better balance. I remember the day that you said it's easier to fill the classrooms. And I think it, I mean, truly believe that it was the consistency and the groundwork that you had done with your consistent marketing pieces like the, the newsletter instead of thinking about the formatting, you're thinking about the content and being more intentional of the timing of the subject of content so that it mirrors what you want to talk about that's an upcoming course that you might offer. It has turned out really well. And that's why I say it's distorted thinking or illogical thinking, because there ha- you have to prime the pump somehow. So When I invest in you to make sure all those things are happening, like right now, I have really fallen away from social media, but you keep the presence there. So even if it's not like me engaging and interacting with people online, fine, they haven't forgotten about me because I still have that presence. And the time I can now spend reviewing a course, for example, and making it better or hiring someone to write the workbook and then reviewing that workbook. But that's something that I need to focus on. That's going to earn me more money in the future. 
and you can continue to make sure everything moves along, actually. You make sure the newsletter goes out. You make sure that I'm reminded if I forget to write the, the article for that. And you're right, it fills the courses. The same with the consulting business. When my newsletter goes out every single month, you know, that's keeping me constantly in front of people and it works. The business comes in. And when it gets out on social media, you know, people are constantly seeing me and they comment to me all the time about that. You know, like, oh, I see you everywhere. Yeah, that's great. You do. And that's really your fault, Dela, because it would <laughs> have been very sporadic otherwise. But it's still, it's, it's fearful. And when you have to spend the money to make the money, that takes a leap of faith in the beginning. And it, I hesitated a long time, probably way too long before hiring you. It is scary because I know as I built my team for my business, that is something to consider too. You can delegate a little bit at a time and it kind of moves with your budget. I think it scare me more to hire somebody for 20 hours a week, 30 hours a week, just to keep them on the payroll. And I would not have enough to fill their day. It's one of the reasons why the virtual assistant is such a fantastic thing to keep that way. And I did evaluate, should I hire someone full time for that kind of role? And the reason I didn't is because I needed someone with a specific skill set. So I hired a, a researcher for the consulting firm because really the work that you're doing for me, I don't, I don't need someone who's available all the time to do it. If I plan ahead and if I'm disciplined, then it's not a problem. Like you can keep doing that. Um, we can add uh, different projects and then take them away. But when there's a skill set that you really need somebody with that dedicated expertise, like the research, you know, I can't escape that. Contracting it out stopped working. It stopped being cost effective. That, that's a different scenario. The, the virtual assistant is still working, still going strong. And that may change, you know, in 2019 for the Institute, for example, you know, some of those tasks may wind up in a full-time position, but I have no doubt we'll still be working together because things still have to grow and there, there's still a place. You know, if I look at the sort of traditional employee hierarchy, eventually maybe I'll hire a marketing person. Eventually maybe, you know, I'll have, well, first I'll have that education coordinator who's making sure all the courses run. But still, you, you can still see where there's still the pieces that you would be doing. I'm going to have to be pretty darn big before I don't need all those little things done for me. Well, I think it's a great option to grow any business that can grow into having a full-time employee because sometimes in, in some business structures, it doesn't make sense to continue on with a virtual assistant. It's kind of like a stopgap type thing, um, a transition time. For others, it's hiring several with different expertise, several um, virtual assistants. And for others, it's a blend of full-time employees, and then that person that works on certain projects and, and things like that. So I, I'm glad that technology has got us to where we can have different opportunities. Because years ago, it, was, it just didn't seem like we had those opportunities. It, it was a challenge to keep. It was much more scarier to hire somebody for things, well, it was, I think. It was, because everything was fixed. Like, hiring a virtual assistant gives you flexibility to keep bending in different shapes. You know, I, I can hire a contractor until I have enough to hire a full-time person for a specific skill set. But in the past, you know, you had to hire the, you had to lease a physical space and then you would hire someone full-time or part-time. And then it was a fixed amount of time, very inflexible. And it would be difficult to grow that way. You know, this is so much easier. And not only does it make it easier to grow the company, but it makes it easier to build a lifestyle that you want. You know, whether you want to grow really fast or whether you just want to grow at a, a pace that you feel more comfortable with. You're right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very flexible option. And we've worked together that way where some tasks I take away from you because it's a reshifting. 
and then other tasks get added back. It's been fun. Well, it has been for me too. What's your biggest challenge with working with a remote team? Well, I'm so glad for Slack because that has really changed everything for me. <laughs> um, Slack allows me to communicate with contractors, um, employee, my vendors, like a it's just a great way to keep everybody in one place. It's the instant messaging that makes it so much better than email. I think I feel so much more connected. Otherwise, yeah, I like it better than actually texting as well. I mean, it's it's your instant messaging for work stuff. I love it. Right, and it can go not just on the phone. You know, I like it on the desktop. I like to be able to type from my laptop. Me too. Yeah, a virtual team otherwise is challenging to build the rapport at the beginning. My new employee for the consulting firm, we have never, we met face to face at a conference years ago when I wasn't even thinking about an employee. Um, and we haven't met face to face since, which is a wild notion. Um, I will make it happen next year, but that causes some distance. And especially I would imagine for a new employee, you know, how is she going to feel that she's doing what she's supposed to be doing and that her job is secure and all of those things. And I've heard that from other people who work virtually. You can become ignored or your contributions aren't understood or appreciated because they're not seen. So it requires effort to communicate. And again, that weekly meeting with us is so important. With my new employee, we talk every day on the phone just to make sure we have time for casual conversation in addition to work stuff. And we can text on Slack, which is great. When there's quick questions, you know, we actually do banter on Slack as well. I'm sure you do in your team. You know, it's, yeah, it's camaraderie. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you have any advice for anyone thinking about building their team and transitioning into delegating some of the stuff to get off their plate? I think one of the important things to recognize is that it, it's not always a clean process. The, I feel like the most important factor is trust. So if I start, we started with a task that wasn't mission critical. You know, it was the, the newsletter and it was concrete and specific. The newsletter went out on the same day every month for years. So starting out with something like that helped us to get to know each other in a working way. You know, we may have known each other before, but that didn't mean we had the trust to work together. And that once that started to build, then we were more of a team and we could try new things. So starting with something, one piece that's concrete and, and clear is probably the best idea. And for an overworked, overwhelmed small business person, even that can be challenging because you have to carve out the time to explain it, to try to figure out how to work together. It takes more time, but it ends up taking a lot off the plate. Well, you mentioned Slack as a, a tool. Do you, have a, do you have a favorite tool that you use to help with communication or to, just a favorite tool that you use in your business? I know a lot of my fellow colleagues in the nonprofit consulting field have turned to different kinds of team software, whether it's Trello or Basecamp, because it combines everything. It combines the, the communication aspect with the file sharing and process. I don't have a lot of process requirements to the work I do with contractors. So I like the combination of the communication tool in Slack and then Dropbox. I've also used Nomadesk, but a file sharing that works, especially when there's such a risk now from hackers. It is important. I've known people who have had their data hijacked, you know, their laptop hijacked by some unknown malicious entity. So having that um, ability to share files, I found really important. The only other thing I don't have that eventually I'll get to is password sharing. It's just becoming more and more of an issue. I use Dashlane, and I imagine at some point I might purchase a sort of enterprise version of that because things need to be shared, and especially with mm -hmm. you, um, but now also with other contractors, 
um, I'm having a developer working on my website and I have to share some passwords with that person and I, I think that's the next iteration of software uh, to worry about but for right now Slack and Dropbox are my ultimate favorites. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your time Jen for talking with me and your journey to building a team and you keep on growing and, and thriving and it's been a pleasure working with you. You know, you've been a tremendous help with me and, and my growth of learning so many different tools, aspects, and I love being a part of your world. Appreciate you being on the podcast today. Thanks for having me, Gayla, and thanks for working with me because it is sort of a, it's not a marriage, but it certainly requires a relationship. And I'm glad that we were able to connect and have that kind of relationship. It's definitely mutual. I learn a lot from you as well. So thanks for having me as a guest. Well, thank you so much. I guess we'll be talking again soon. We sure will. I hope you enjoyed today's interview with Jennifer Phila. You know the old saying, the riches are in the niches. Well, I truly believe that. Jen serves a specific niche in prospect research, but I'd venture to say that many of us with small businesses have some of the same fears and apprehensions about starting to delegate. I'm so glad that she took the time to talk about her experiences in building and working with a remote team. We talked about several links, so hop on over to scrivenersolutions.com forward slash 16 for all the links mentioned in the show notes. If you found today's show helpful, please subscribe to the show on iTunes and leave a comment. You can always send questions and comments to podcast at scrivenersolutions.com. That's podcast at S-C-R-I-V-E-N-E-R solutions.com. Until next time, have a fantastic week.